Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to MSB lecture series on main group chemistry. In my last lecture, I was speaking about chemistry of group 1 elements. Let me continue from where I had stopped. Okay. Let me begin with a question. Let us uh, look into the ionic radii of group 1 elements. It follows this order. Okay. Let us look into the hydrated uh, ion radial. hydrated ion radii. So, this follows a different trend, exactly opposite trend. So, we have to look into it what is the reason for this one. Let us look into first ionic radii. So, here we know that uh, the size of atoms increases down the group. Okay. As a result what happens the relative energy of the cations also of removing the valence electron also should increase. So, this is according to the periodic trend and classification. So, that is correct. So, lithium is the smallest and cesium is the largest ion. So, ionic radius increases, but what is happening here is in case of hydrated ions radius decreases. So, this is because as charge to size ratio decreases when we go from lithium to cesium, okay, uh, hydration enthalpy also decreases. When the hydration enthalpy decreases, they have less and less tendency to get hydrated or coordinated to water molecules. That means, lithium shows because of larger charge to size ratio, it shows more hydration energy and coordination will be more efficient with lithium. And from lithium to cesium, when you go across, go down the group, this hydration energy. So, the coordinating ability decreases. As a result what happens? Surrounding the ions less and less number of water molecules will be there. As a result what happens? The hydrated radius obviously decreases. So, this is because of the decrease in the hydration enthalpy. When the hydration enthalpy decreases, they lose the ability to get coordinated with ligands such as water. As a result in its coordination sphere less number of water molecules will be there as expected the hydrated radius will decrease. So, let us look into another question here. Conductivity of lithium plus ion in water is less than that of cesium plus ion, although their size suggests an opposite order explain. This is exactly what I was explaining in my previous uh, question to the previous question. Just recall again whatever I said, the smaller the size of the ion, the greater is the degree of hydration. Okay. When the size is small, the degree of hydration is more, thus lithium plus ion with the smallest size and highest charge to size ratio shows largest hydration enthalpy among all group 1 elements. So, the degree of hydration decreases on moving down the group that is from lithium to cesium plus. 
due to the difference in degree of hydration ionic radii of hydrated alkali metal ions decreases from lithium to cesium thus the ionic radii in aqueous solution decreases in the order. So, now uh, sometime after uh, learning inorganic chemistry or main group chemistry or transfer metal chemistry always some questions comes to your mind why I should learn main group chemistry. Main group elements or main group chemistry is an important branch of inorganic chemistry and we come across uh, utility of main group elements and their compounds in all walks of our life. So, let me disclose some of those things as we progress with this course. Let us look into some aspects concerned with the main group elements especially group 1 elements. So, let us look into the potassium salts and the resources and commercial demand. So, world production of potash okay, or potassium hydroxide rose from 0.3 to metric ton in 1900 to around 50 metric ton in 2007 with major producers being Canada and the former Soviet Union USSR followed by Germany and about 90 percent of potash that is produced worldwide is used in fertilizer manufacturing. So, now the potash production is around 70 metric tons. Okay, so, that shows the importance of uh, potassium salts especially potassium hydroxide. Let us look into one more important aspect that revolves around cesium. Keeping time with cesium, what does it mean? In 1993, so National Institute of Standards of Technology that is NIST okay, uh, brought into use a cesium based atomic clock called this is called NIST 7 which kept international standard time to within 1 second in 10 to the power of 6 years. That means, the accuracy is 1 second in 10 to the power of 6 years. So, this indicates the kind of accuracy we are looking into. So, the system depends upon repeated transitions from the ground to a specific excited state of atomic CS and the monitoring of the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation that is emitted. In 1995, the first cesium fountain clock that is called cesium fountain clock was constructed at the Paris Observatory in France, a fountain clock also called as NIST F1 was introduced in 1999 in the US to function as the country's primary time and frequency standard and NIST F1 fountain clock is accurate to within 1 second in 20 into 10 to the power of 6 years. Okay. While earlier cesium clock observed cesium atoms at ambient temperatures, cesium fountain clock use lasers to slow down and cool the atoms to temperature approaching 0 Kelvin. For an online demonstration, Okay, you can also look into the website so here if you
Okay. So, this can give you more information. Of course, I have taken this information from Inarian Chemistry book by C. E. Housecraft and A. G. Sharp. You can get more information from this website. So, another important application of alkali metals is in ion, uh, in alkali metal ion batteries. Okay. A sodium sulfur battery okay, operates around 570 to 620 Kelvin and consists of a molten sodium anode sodium anode and liquid sulfur cathode cathode separated by a solid beta alumina electrolyte so the cell reaction overall cell reaction i'm going to write here liquid form because it is operates such, uh, such a high temperature 570 to 620 Kelvin. So, we are considering sodium, molten sodium and liquid sulfur. And here is 0 0.2 volts. So, and this is reversed when the battery is recharged by changing the polarity of the cell. Trials with the sodium sulfur battery in electric vehicles are quite promising, but further development is essentially needed to commercialize it. The high operating temperature is the major drawback with this sodium sulfide cell. And of course, several properties of lithium including its highly negative reduction potential makes it much more suitable in battery industry. For example, if you consider lithium iron sulphide battery that contains a lithium anode anode and ferrous sulphide cathode. Okay. The E cell is 1.5 volts okay. and it finds uses in small devices such as cameras. An important advancement in battery technology has been the development of lithium ion batteries. The lithium ion battery has a cell potential of 3.6 volts and consists of a lithium cobalt oxide electrode and that is separated from a graphite electrode by a solid by solid electrolyte across which lithium ions can migrate when the cell is charging. The lithium plus ions are intercalated by graphite essentially LiC6 we call it because uh, lithium is 6 coordinated when the lithium vapors are passed between graphite at about higher temperature lithium atoms sit in between the graphite having a coordination of 6 carbon atoms that means lithium assumes an octahedral geometry having 3 carbons below and 3 carbons. So, essentially that is the reason the composition we call it as LiC6. So, here lithium ions are intercalated by graphite uh, and return to the LiCoO2 electrode when the cell is discharged. The cell reaction can be written in this fashion.
cobalt oxide. So, the crucial factor in this battery is that both electrode are able to act as hosts for lithium plus ions and the system has been termed as rocking chair as lithium okay, oscillates between both sides of this one. So, essentially both the electrode. Uh, so, that means we have two host materials and both of can can take lithium okay, while charging and discharging. So, lithium ion batteries have applications in laptop, notebooks, computers, mobile phones and portable audio video devices and have potential use in electrical car as well. So, let me give some more information in this slide. So, lithium rechargeable battery so that I had mentioned okay, uh, mainly uses this lithium cobalt oxide as the cathode with a lithium graphite anode as I mentioned there you are taking the composition of lithium to carbon as 1 is to 6. So, lithium ions are produced at the anode during the battery discharge to maintain charge balance cobalt 4 is reduced to cobalt 3 in the form of LiCO2. If you look into species here cobalt is in plus 3 state at the cathode. So, it, the reaction occurring during battery discharge is shown here. So, at cathode this is what the reaction happens and at anode this is the reaction. So, the battery is rechargeable because both the cathode and the anode can act as host for lithium ions which can move back and forth and hence this battery is also called rock chair battery. So, that means uh, charging and discharging can happen simultaneously. So, let me come to another important application. Uh, you may be surprised to see uh, why I have brought uh, car airbags into the discussion especially while discussing the chemistry of uh, main group elements that is alkali metals. Of course, there is some chemistry behind these car bags that has to do something with group 1 elements especially sodium. Let us look into it what it is. You can see this is the steering wheel of car and here this is where the airbag is fixed in this one. You can see here. So, when there is an impact airbag start getting inflated and this is how it happens okay. and you can see how it protects the driver and co-passenger. Okay. You can see this one okay. something like this. So, let us look into uh, some technicality of car airbags before I come to the chemistry part that means the utility of uh, alkali metals in airbags. Okay. So, let us look into how airbags work. Timing is very very important in airbags ability to deploy quickly enough to save a life in a head on collision. An airbag must be able to deploy in a matter of milliseconds from the initial collision impact and also be prevented from deploying when there is no head on collision. That means, when sudden application of brake is there or when the car moves or humps uh, with small uh, jerks and all those things should not lead to the opening of the airbag. Thus, okay, the precautions has to be taken. Okay. That means, the main component of the airbag system is a sensor that can detect only head on collisions and immediately trigger the airbag's deployment. The crash sensor essentially is a steel ball that slides inside a smooth bore okay, next to the airbag. So, the ball is held in place by a permanent magnet or by a stiff spring which inhibits the ball's motion when the car drives over bumps and potholes. So, that means, unless and otherwise there is a head on collision, okay, the deployment of airbag should not take place. However, when the car decelerates very quickly as in a head on crash, the ball suddenly moves forward and turns on an electrical circuit initiating the process of inflating the airbag. Okay. Once the electrical circuit has been turned on, by the sensor a pellet of sodium azide is ignited. This is where the chemistry comes into picture. 
So, that means once the electrical circuit has been turned on by the sensor immediately after uh, having a head on collision a pellet of sodium azide NaN3 is get ignited. A rapid reaction occurs generating nitrogen gas that is responsible for the inflation of the air bag. So, this bag fills a nylon or a polyamide bag used in making the car bag at a velocity of 150 to 250 miles per hour. So, this process from the initial impact of the crash to full inflation of the air bag takes only about 40 milliseconds. It is only about 40 milliseconds. So, this is equivalent to 0 0.04 second. Okay. So, that means ideally the body of the driver or a passenger sitting next to him should hit the air bag just after inflation. In fact, while the air bag begins to deflate. Otherwise, the high internal pressure of the air bag would create a surface as had a stone in that case instead of protecting the life it can do more damage to the passenger. So, now let us look into the chemistry behind this one. Okay. Uh, so, we are essentially igniting sodium azide. So, what would happen to sodium azide? So, that is what we are doing is decomposition of sodium azide present inside the air bag. Okay. This decomposes to form 2 Na and 3 equivalents of nitrogen. So, this nitrogen is responsible for deflating air bag. So, that means during this process uh, we are getting uh, elemental sodium and elemental sodium is quite toxic and hazardous and it can also irritate the skin. Uh, so, in that case we find a way to neutralize this one. How it is done? You can see that in this is reaction 1. In the reaction 2 I will show you how to neutralize the sodium that is released during the decomposition of sodium azide. So, that means along with sodium azide, okay, we should also keep inside the air bag small quantity of potassium nitrate. This potassium nitrate reacts with sodium that is liberated during the decomposition of sodium azide to form sodium oxide, potassium oxide plus extra nitrogen is also released. This also helps in inflating the air bag. So, one more reaction is there. Now, we have to neutralize they are also quite uh, hygroscopic and can be hazardous. Now, we have to find a way to neutralize them. In reaction 3, I am going to show that one. K2O plus Na2O, we are adding some silica SiO2 to neutralize both what we get is sodium potassium silicate. So, this is called alkaline silicate glass. Okay, so, at this stage if something happens to air bag and if any leakage is there, uh, there will not be any damages okay, to the uh, life of an individual who is sitting in front of this air bag. So, that means a certain pressure is required to fill the air bag within milliseconds. Once this pressure has been determined, the ideal gas law can be used to calculate the amount of N2 that must be generated to fill the air bag to this required pressure. The amount of sodium azide in the gas generator is then carefully chosen to generate this exact amount of nitrogen gas. So, typically a car air bag 
has a capacity of 70 liters, okay. capacity of airbag is 70 liters approximately and this requires about 130 grams of sodium azide. Okay. So, 130 grams means essentially if we just look into the molecular weight of sodium azide, it is essentially 23 plus 42, it is 65. 65 grams is equal to 65 grams equals 1 mole. Okay. We need approximately 2 moles that is 130 grams, 2 moles we need and we need about 13 grams of KNO3. Okay. So, that means a typical air bag contain 130 grams of sodium azide and 13 grams of potassium nitrate and then the equivalent amount of uh, silica, uh, these things okay, are there in the air bag. Okay. This is how air bag works. I will show you this uh, video. Uh, uh, it gives some information about uh, the nature of alkali metals. For example, if uh, uh, lithium is put into water, you can see how it uh, ignites. Now, let us look into the sodium what would happen. If you add little bit of sodium to uh, water, you can see okay, it rigorously, uh, very vigorously it reacts okay, and here uh, the color whatever you are seeing is due to the liberation of H2 hydrogen gas and that hydrogen gas combines with oxygen to form water highly exothermic. And you can see this explosion in slow motion. So, just look into it what would happen if you put a, a half a kilo of sodium into water. Okay. Of course, one should not try these things, these are all tried under okay, uh, taking all kind of safety norms. Uh, one should not try this kind of reactions because it can do damage to marine animals. That shows uh, the reactivity of uh, okay, uh, these alkali metals, this is with rubidium. As I mentioned reactivity increases when you go down a group that means reactivity of rubidium is much more drastic okay violent compared to sodium or potassium cesium is even more reactive so let us before i conclude uh, my lecture on chemistry of uh, main group elements. Let me just give some idea about who discovered these alkali metals. You already saw how they look like, this is how lithium looks like, lithium is much lighter uh, compared to rest of the uh, alkali metals. You can see it is floating on hydrocarbon and this was discovered by John August uh, in 1817 and this is sodium. Uh, you can see that grey color is because of formation of sodium oxide layer on it, otherwise it should be looking like silver with shiny surface and potassium is this one. Uh, when you fresh melt it, uh, it appears like uh, a silver ball and both of them were discovered by Humphrey Davy in 1807. Of course, sodium uh, he identified by the electrolysis of sodium hydroxide and same time we also uh, find out the existence of potassium. And then this is uh, uh, rubidium and cesium, uh, they are kept in a sealed vial. These two are discovered by uh, Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff uh, from Germany 
and you must be familiar with uh, Robert uh, Bunsen's name in the schools and colleges uh, uh, we used to use Bunsen burner uh, for doing flame test and other things that Bunsen is the person who is responsible for discovering Bunsen burner. With this let me summarize uh, the chemistry of uh, group 1 elements are uh, group 1 elements and their compounds follow the periodic properties and trends with very least or no variations. They strictly follow the periodic trends. Alkali metals are highly reactive just now you witnessed in the, in the slide in, I showed and form basic oxides and water soluble halides containing M plus cations that means group oxygen state is plus 1. Okay, and alkali metal compounds whether hydrates, oxides, halides or organometallic compounds ionic properties dominates the chemistry and most of them are ionic in nature. However, lithium with its small size and having a larger charge to size ratio shows partial covalent character in almost all bonds that makes with other main group elements. Okay. And it has more resemblance to magnesium rather than sodium or potassium. Okay. With, with this I conclude my lecture on uh, group 1 elements. In my next lecture I will be drawing your attention to the chemistry of group 2 elements. Until then have a present time of reading inorganic chemistry. Thank you very much. Vayam Prabha, Digital India, Educated India.